people know. Kim, you prepared a, a boatload of topics that stem from our conversation last week. Do you have any other questions or insights that might lead to further discussion on goaltending? I, uh, I have developed like some fundamental movement exercises with goalies that I can do when I'm an assistant coach and the coach wants to work on other things and I'm comfortable with them. They're all movement, stable balance, proper stance, mirroring your other goaltender in movements laterally, forwards and backwards. And that's all I do is focus on the stance. Now, when I was scouting, looking at goalies, sort of we all rely on Go the goalie coach, at least I did for most goalie selections with national camps. I didn't really look at them that closely. Look at their behaviors, look at their technique, look at their compete. But I did have as a scout a very simple observation. Number one, they have to stop the first shot. If they don't, we're probably not watching. If they stop the first and second shots, we're going to watch them. If they can stop the three shots in a row, you might be seriously keeping them. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing to do with the uh, those techniques, you know, the nuances, just the ability to stop the puck. And over many years, there's been some pretty good goalies that we wouldn't consider as being very technical that stop the puck. And Dominic Hasek might be the best one. And you might call him an orthodox, but the level of compete is amazing in some goaltenders. And I look for that intangible quality in players, skaters as well. The level of compete is critical. But with a goalie, it comes through the character of compete. Um, and not all kids have it. And not all players have that level of compete. But it's certainly becoming a scouting quality to look for that will make players get to a level we never imagined. So, Perry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, on, on a note, you mentioned Dominic Hasek. The one thing that he did that not a lot of people know is that, you know, with all the crazy moves that he made, I had a, I wish I still had it, I had a collage of him, and it was probably 30 to 40 different slides, and every one of those slides in various body positions, his eyes were, were always on the puck. It, it's absolutely <coughs> phenomenal. His ability to see the release of the shot, no matter when it's coming, and he would do whatever it took to stop that puck. But at the end of the day, the biggest thing that he was doing was seeing the puck. And it sounds really simple, but it's not. So when you talk about compete, compete is great, but compete with seeing the puck too, phenomenal. And that's what he was. Anyway, I do have to leave soon, unfortunately. I have another call at 1230, but I can't thank you guys enough for this call. I thought it was amazing. What a great panel that you've put together, Wally, of great hockey experts. And that's what I'll call these guys. And ladies, I just love it. Seeing you, Kim, great to see you. Uh, Wally, I can't thank you enough for the ability to be on this call. So thank you. Perry, take care. And great to have you, Perry. Join us anytime, Perry. I will do that. Thank you so much, guys. Okay. I really appreciate it. Tim, have a great day. Everyone else, have a great day. Right, Take care, guys. See you soon. Okay. Thank you, care, Perry. Rick? Yeah, just to hitchhike on what Perry just said about Dominic Hasek, you might remember a fellow named Kiprasov that played here for a day or two. Same one. One of the things that always struck me about him, he never lost sight of the puck. He, he had a bearing on it coming in, and he knew exactly where it went, and if he didn't, he sure found it in a hurry. It's a, it is a key component of good goaltending. Being totally aware as often as much as possible as to where the puck is. 
Oh, I wish Perry had stayed on because uh, I went to a a clinic and uh, an NHL former NHL player now coaching uh, was doing a clinic and he talked about teaching defense, but how to play two on ones. And the question I had was, you know, we teach the defense to prevent the pass across, to delay the outside carry and don't, don't get beat. And one thing this clinician did with minor hockey coaches, and they were double A and above, he talked about Kiprasov and he wanted the attacker to overplay the puck carrier so he would throw it across. So Kiprasov made that save because it was coached for. So I, I mentioned to him that, look, we're working with minor hockey coaches here, and we sort of are reared in a fundamental way to teach how to play two-on-ones. And now all of a sudden, we've got this new technique of pressuring the puck. And I was a little, little concerned that fundamentally we're sort of conditioned to teaching a D how to play a one-on-one and a two-on-one, uh, do your layout, but you, you prevent that pass across. And in this case, you're encouraging it. And it worked for Kiprasov. I'm not sure at what level, now you're a coach, you create a tactic that's specific to allowing your goalie to be the best player on the team. At what age? Does that make sense here? Am I concerned? Anybody? Uh, Rick? Well, my first thought on that, Wally, was what I, a little bit of what I referred to earlier, where we're changing the game dramatically for one group of people. Uh, <laughs> when they move on to a, a more traditional style of coaching, uh, they're going to be they're going to be poorly trained to deal with that. And I'm I'm still advocate that we teach the the basic ground rules of the game, and then when you get to a certain level where it's going to be exclusive exclusively in that group, yeah, you can you can do those things. But I wouldn't suggest what uh, you know the Kiprasoff method to many kids in particular, because you're only going to set them up for disagreement with coaching as they move on up the line. Okay, anybody. Anything else, Tad, on the goaltending side? I would just add, Wally, like on that point, I'm just again thinking about my U9s and even the U11s I coach. Like, I don't think that's a bad strategy. <laughs> like, again, at least as a skill set, like, for example, we teach our players to wheel it out no matter what right now. And they say, well, what if there's, we say, don't worry about what if there is, just wheel, try to hold on to the puck. Right. See how long you can sustain it. Is that what I want them to do in junior hockey? Absolutely not. But uh, based on their strengths right now, it actually makes a lot of sense. Right. For the first half of the season, we told the U9 players, just hunt everybody down. You know, we've just started doing two on ones. And I would say the most effective strategy is going to be to hunt the puck carrier because the chances of her making a pass through pressure and the other person being in the right place or receiving the pass is way less than our player's ability to attack the puck carrier and create a turnover. And I would argue that might still be the case in U11, but you ha it has to be taught in a message of this is a, a tool to use as opposed as this is always the right way to play a two-on-one, right? But I, but I think in, in the female game at least, and, and certainly at the younger, lower levels, right, the more aggressive you are, the more it's going to work in your favor, right? Um, the ability of players to execute tape to tape and make, you know, east-west passes that create scoring chances generally at the double B and B levels and at the younger age groups is a much weaker skill than their ability to skate in and, and shoot it uncontested on the goalie. But again, you know, as Tim always says, it's never, never and always, always, but, or whatever it is, I'm not smart enough to figure that out. I didn't go to Brown, but, um, 
yeah, so that would, you know, for me, I would do that at the young age groups for sure. I would teach that, um, or at least more aggressive, uh, to the puck carrier, um, and see if they can make that pass. And Hey, if at U9, those girls can make that pass and score off that pass. I mean, God bless them. Good job guys. <laughs> but if for our team success, I would teach them to hunt that puck carrier. A number one draft pick played in the NHL running a conditioning camp doing two on ones. And he came up and told me that uh, played for Chicago. He said, uh, no, we take the puck carrier all the time. We force them to make a mistake early. My, my fear of doing it at a young age, Kim, is we've been reared on conventional playing of defense. And, and are we going to lose the ability to transition skate forwards to backwards? Because now we talk about surfing the puck carrier in all three zones, particularly the neutral zone, but now in the defensive zone. Uh, so the balance of transition skating, backwards striding, mohawk pivoting, and the way we've taught how to play one-on-ones was always a mohawk, not a surf. <clears throat> so I don't know. I, I'm like you, Kim. I, I wouldn't do it that young, but if it's going to get results. But at what stage is backwards skating not essential and pivoting not going to be a part of the game? Will they not develop it? So, Tim, go ahead. Just really quickly, at no stage will backwards skating be unimportant or pivoting be unimportant no matter what the development of the game, I would argue that there's still essential skills because, well, the game's not going to change that much. You still have to be able to skate backwards efficiently and effectively and, and pivot efficiently and effectively. And I, I'm sorry because I just jumped out um, uh, to tend to the kitty and get a cup of coffee. If we were talking uh, defending two-on-ones, were you just recently? Yeah, we're talking about Kiprasov and the fact that whoever was coaching at the time was doing a clinic and he talked about we let Kiprasov have the drive skater on the wide side. That was, he wanted him. He demanded it and he made great saves that way. That's the way they played two on one. So they, they pressured the puck carrier on the drive drive. And I question the Doing that at a coaching clinic to double A AA and triple A coaches, and now all coaches beginning to adapt that technique. And what would happen in terms of development might increase outcomes. I guess if Perry was on and say, This might be a question. It's good for the goalies if they move well laterally and they're small. But I don't know. It's, it's just a new way of looking at things and thinking about things. and. Kim, your U9s, U11s, it, it does make sense in terms of competing. But uh, like Tim said, relying on the still having mastering all skills, all direction skating with and without a puck at all positions. And uh, positions are interchangeable. Today, there's much more interchangeability. Defense are involved in forward and direct attacks. And uh, forwards have to cover behind. So uh, it's all good discussion. You know, I think it, it, it really makes sense. I'm not sure what I would do. So what are you going to do, Kim? Are you debating, advocating it now? No. Well, there, there's lots of subtlety here. Like, for starters, if you have a goalie like Kiprasov at the, uh, at the elite level, and maybe you could say that's Bantam, AAA and higher, if you have a goalie that says, I want you to pressure the puck carrier because I'll take the, 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 you know, the off puck player and I'll take that breakaway. If you have a goalie that wants that, have at it. Give it to him uh, because, you know, you could break up a lot of plays. Um, but the flip side of that really is if the goalie really wants that, why don't you give it to him? and take away the pass all the time. Like, it's the same situation. 
And granted, the one difference is you don't have that opportunity to break up the past, so I get that. But uh, the other piece I would add is, and maybe this is something you could work with your U9 with, um, Kim, is the D recognizing is the player with the puck. Is her stick inside or outside? <coughs> if it's inside, coming down the middle of the rink, <clears throat> two things. They have a better shooting angle on the goalie, making it harder for the goalie. The other thing is, if you can get them on their backhand by pressuring the puck, it's way tougher for them especially shoot nines, but at any level, to make a, a good pass on their back end to the open player. So that's maybe a starting point for pressuring on a two-on-one, which I generally don't agree with, um, is if the stick is on the inside, then a better opportunity to pressure and a better situation to pressure in versus if it's on the out, outside. Um and that's, you know, some detail, but e even just that at, at a really young level, if the stick's on the inside, better chance to pressure. If it's on the outside, maybe give it more to the goalie. But the last thing and the most important thing for me is the D should always, once the puck is starting to get inside the circle tops, the D should always be in the prime scoring area. And you see it time and time and time and time again. NHL level doesn't matter where the D gets way outside at the dot line and gives up a clean breakaway down the middle. Like that just makes zero sense to me. Zero sense. Okay. I, I, with all the Royal I, Road studies where even at the most elite levels, you're never, you should never score like you score. 1% of the time from outside the dot line, why would you move outside there and give up a prime scoring chance down the middle? Makes zero sense to me. See, I, I, I'm sort of thinking about what Kim said before we get to Hal and Kim, and I'm thinking that when you pressure the puck carrier all the time, it's in keeping with Kim's system of play. Always pressure the puck. If you're closest, pressure the puck. It reduces the options, provides less in time and space for the carrier, and it makes sense. Now we're conditioned to the, you know, the situational possibilities of a two-on-one attack versus you're you're limiting the possibilities, and it's easier to skate forward in pressure and do that. So uh, I'm scratching my head now, but I didn't play defense. But I did work with the national team on defensive tactical skills, and we spent mo so much time on transitional forward to backward skating and playing those situations. <clears throat> and uh, this sort of does make a little bit of sense, and I guess it's worth discussing. So uh, I'll just interject before they go. You're also uh, making less time for back checker help, and you're less time for rebound help if a shot does come. The longer you delay, uh, more time for back checkers to get back and help, more time for back checkers to be in position to deny a second chance, which often often results. There's no right answer, it's just all philosophy, but I'm, I'm definitely not a give the goalie a breakaway kind of guy. That's a, a great double A chance a two on one is a grade A chance, and I'll take my chances with the grade A. With that Kiprasov exception, if you want a goalie that wants that, then give it to him or, or her. Kim, your level, and then we'll go to hell. Yeah, I'm just playing with drills here. Uh, I sent you guys one, and then I realized I forgot one. So um, I've been, to all your points, I've been doing some backward skating and some pivoting. So it's all getting addressed now that we're at full ice. Don't you worry. C cuts are coming out. Um, and so I just sent the progression we've been doing uh, the last two weeks. Um, and it's worked out really well. It's just a basic one-on-one -on -one where there's no puck. 
So I think you can see there, like, the, the attacker is on the red line, the defender is on the dot line, blue line. And it's a one-on-one, -on -one, but it's a race to the blue ice. So there's no puck. And so the trigger we used and on the practice ice we're on, the neutral zone is tiny. So the cue we've given the backward skater is she can't turn to go forwards until the attacker has crossed the blue line. And the timing of that, I kind of figured out, works really well for our age group. But they have to take some number of backward strides first before they can turn facing the player and try to beat them into the blue ice. And we've done that every practice. So certainly the practice is we have no goalies. There's no puck. But just that intention of turning and winning the race to the blue ice, I think is a really strong one, whether there was a puck or not, right? I mean, this is, if you get beat, you got to get back to the blue ice. If, if she's going to the blue ice, you got to get to the blue ice. So we started there. The coaches kind of gave me a weird look. They're like, that's not really a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm like, no, this is the essence of a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, then we added a puck, same drill. And then I actually made it a one-on-two next. Again, to um, increase that uh, hunter's wanting and willingness to go and hunt the puck, right? Because well, of course we don't want both these backing in when it's only one puck carrier, but I see it all the time at U U9 and U11 um, when players have been told, oh, well, you just back in. Um, and then we make it a two-on-one, then we make it a two-on-two. <laughs> so the girls kind of get the drills now. We've done it, I think, in about four practices. And so they, they know the turn and go drills. Um, so we've got a tournament this weekend. We've got four games. Uh, and we do, we're setting goals for them this weekend for the four games. And what we've said is for each game, we want three great defensive hunts. That's the goal. So one, you know, three great turn and goes where you hunt the girl down. And then that's, if they get the three a game, then we get a check mark. But any breakaways we give up is a minus one, right? So it's kind of enticing them because we've given them this skill set now of turning and going. Right. And now they've got a concrete goal for the tournament in each game to try to uh, limit breakaways and maximize the number of time they hunt down the puck carrier. So, you know, just simple, like they're so simple drills, um, but we'll see this weekend if, if they seem to have uh, the performance effect we want. And we don't have, you know, D's uh, per se. So everybody is doing those drills. Um and, you know, we, we haven't even talked to the attackers about how to exploit that yet because most of them will just skate down the wall. So we'll get there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's where being able to teach these players something, like this is the first time they've ever heard probably what a two-on-one is their whole life. Like they, they're so new, it's actually really exciting. And it's fun for me to go, okay, like what's, what's the most important thing here? is probably winning the race back to the blue ice. Like to me, that's the most important thing that's going to translate and then layering it on above that. So, um, yeah, you know what? It's worked out well. And it, it has with every team we play against, again, there's five kids on every team who are way better than everybody else. They're not going to do great under pressure. They're going to do great in open ice. Right. So it's a bit of a, like it leads to success on a team level, but um, having watched so many of the older girls and older age groups, they're so timid. They go, like, it's not physical enough. There's not enough pressure put on properly. So if I can plant that seed early, I don't know. I think it will fare well for our girls in, in the in the long term. Hell. Yeah, I think there's a lot. There's actually a number of topics in that. Uh, and, and thanks, uh, Kim, for sharing what you're doing. Um, uh, for these, you know, I think it's a difference between girls and boys. Number one, I hate to say that, but my experience coaching them, even at the high school level, is they prefer to pass unnecessarily, and they will take themselves out of a great scoring position to pass to their friend, <laughs> may or may not be in a, in a good scoring position or get it done. What I've always for many years working on two on ones, I my philosophy is obviously the defenseman has to go backwards. But then we have this conversation about who's the most dangerous player, the puck carrier or the other, the non puck carrier. And in my mind, it's, it's the non puck carrier is the most dangerous and likely to score. And so I sort of play them 50-50, maybe as you get across the blue line and start 
backing up towards your net, if the puck carrier stays outside, that's an easy save for my goalie. Okay, and so I tell my defenseman, our goal is to force him to shoot because he's running out of time and space. And if he doesn't have a clear passing opportunity because you now are drifting over towards and you're plugging up his passing lane, going to shoot it. And I, you know, I tell him, I says, if it goes in, it's on the goalie. Because the goalie's had, you know, the goalie's had 60 feet to watch him come in and take that shot. But if you pivot and lo- go to the puck, and as soon as you pivot and go to the puck, and the puck goes to the guy in front, now he's got a shooting goalie. He's got a moving goalie. Odds go up significantly that you're going to get scored on. And I also tell kids, when you w- w- at the end of the play, when you come to the bench, you want the coach to yell at somebody else, <laughs> not you. <laughs> and so, um, you know, take care of the business. So it's sort of a 50-50, and then it becomes like a 40-30. I mean, but then when you get down on the hash marks, great. As Tim said, you got to just be ready to, to battle in the pain. 